Welcome to our show, Meaning and Motivation, where we explore the many ways that we make meaning together and why we do what we do, our motivation. I'm your host, Tim Thompson, and with me today are Professors Umemi Sababu and Eeyore Bemko. And they're going to be part of a series coming up on Abraham Lincoln and celebrating 150 years since the Civil War. Uh, it's a three-day event that's going to be going on, uh, and part of it, right in the middle of that, coming up, I think, April 23rd, mm -hmm. is uh, the iconic Lincoln. Yes. And Umebi, you're mm -hmm. going to be presenting something on Lincoln, yes. and then Eeyore, you are going to be um, critiquing uh, yeah. what gets presented. Right. So, yeah. um, maybe what, what are you going to be presenting? Well, I think it's interesting how we view Lincoln as the president of the United States during the Civil War. You know, I'm kind of concerned about the uh, halo over Lincoln, uh, known as the Great Emancipator. You know, one of the things I do in class is that I ask uh, students to tell me about Lincoln. What, the, what does the Great Emancipator mean? And I think that when we look at Lincoln and look at his, his background, that we have to really kind of challenge this whole notion that he, quote unquote, freed the slaves. You know, he's mostly known for freeing the enslaved persons. But in fact, when you look at the contours of American history in the 19th century, and you look at the situation and the conditions that existed prior to the Civil War, I think we have to understand that Lincoln came into the Civil War with a certain ideal. You know, and I would also argue that in many respects, that he was not the great emancipator, that he was an astute politician who understood the context of the times he was living in. He understood, in fact, that in order to win the Civil War, he had to utilize those four, almost four million individuals who were enslaved. So I think that an a, a image needs to be made of the events that led Lincoln to sign the Emancipation Proclamation. One of the things people don't know is that initially his plan was to either colonize African Americans into another country, or to compensate slave owners for the slaves that they own itself. Well, that was his initial plan. Oh, yeah, initial plan. W wait, even, was even to colonize, colonize African Americans into a different country? Yes, well, that was uh, mm -hmm. that was a uh, plan that goes back to the eighteen uh, twenties um, and eighteen mm -hmm. teens. Uh, Liberia mm -hmm. was one of the places that uh, they talked about. The capital of Liberia today is mm -hmm. Monrovia, named after. President Monroe, our mm -hmm. fifth president. So mm -hmm. this idea of colonization is, is something that's been around mm -hmm. by the time Lincoln is, is inaugurated in 1861. This idea has been around and it's been uh, uh, debated, mm -hmm. especially in the African American community. Mm -hmm. And most African American leaders by 1861 have said, hell yeah. no. But even, in, even when it came up, it was, it was the American <coughs> Colonization Society in 1816 that met uh, to actually uh, colonize uh, African Americans into Liberia or any other place, even African leaders at that time rejected the ideal that they should be move, removed from the country to another place itself. Um, and what happened was that, um, particularly Jane, people like James Fortin, and, uh, who was the African leader from Philadelphia, and Robert Allen, who was the leader of the African uh, Methodist Episcopal Church, they rejected this notion that we were, quote unquote, not Americans. They had been born here, bred here, and they lived here. Uh, unfortunately, Lincoln thought that this was a way to solve the problem in the South, pro solve the problem of slavery itself. In 1860, I believe he, 1861, he met with a number of African leaders, including Frederick Douglass, you know, with this idea that maybe we can solve the race issue, you know, if African Americans were removed from the society itself. So uh, this idea, as Dr. Bimco has said, has been rejected constantly. But the, but, the, but the notion for me is that if Lincoln was the great emancipator and wanted to end slavery, you know, passionately, you know, then why suggest this notion of compensating slave owners for an institution that he thought was wrong, or even sending African Americans outside of the country to solve this particular issue itself? Even on the eve of the Emancipation Proclamation, which is really problematic for me, December of 1862, when the proclamation had already been signed and was supposed to go into effect on January 1st, up until the last day, he had hoped that in fact that they would accept colonization and compensate the emancipation to solve this whole race uh, race issue itself. Now this, mm -hmm. is, this is after the Civil War had already started. Right? Yes. Uh -huh. it, it, it had started and then right. the Emancipation Proclamation and then but you have an issue with mm -hmm. that that's not necessarily... That's necessarily the case. Even in 1861 when the war began, you know, the question was should African Americans be allowed to fight in the war? You know, Lincoln uh, passed a motion stating that African Americans, whether free or enslaved persons, 
should not be utilized to fight in the war itself. When some slaves escaped from Virginia, General McClellan sent, them, sent the slaves back to slavery in itself. So for two years, there was no utilization of any African Americans whatsoever. And in 1863, we have, of course, the um, 54th Massachusetts Regiment, which was the first regiment, black regiment, to fight in the war itself. Only as a result, again, of the fact that the Union was not winning the war. And I think it was General um, uh, Ulysses S. Grant who stated that the way to win this war was to utilize those four, almost four million contraband who were, in fact, were already escaping from the South. Mm -hmm. This is why I think that we miss out on, on, on the whole Lincoln issue is that African Americans were taking human agencies themselves. They were not simply waiting around for Lincoln to say, well, you know, you're free now. They were not waiting around for that. They were slave rebellions, slave riots, people were running away. Where are those people in the story about the emancipation? Where, mm -hmm. where are those stories and those words about? So the part Lincoln? of it is mm -hmm. that it was going to happen. It was already happening anyway. Yes. Around. Uh -huh. And so he was just kind of following in something, a trend that's occurring, yeah, whether the, he's part of it or not. The abolitionist movement itself I mean, was having a great deal to play in terms of pushing Lincoln, you know, toward ending slavery itself. And the abolition movement, the modern abolition movement, had its beginning in the 1830s, now, goes back to the 1700s, but in the 1830s, when William Lloyd Garrison begins to write about enslavement, begins to say that the Constitution is a pro-slavery document, from 1830 onward, that we have a number of individuals, you know, not only who are pushing the end of slavery itself, but who are helping slaves escape through the, 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 uh, through the uh, tunnels in Pennsylvania and Ohio up into Canada itself. So again, these people have to be talked about, and this movement has to be talked about in terms of influencing Lincoln to do what he would not have done mm -hmm. otherwise. But now these abolitionists mm -hmm. are also kind of uh, complex uh, people. Mm -hmm. They've yeah. got uh, debate within the abolitionist community as to what sort of rights should exactly. these uh, uh, former slaves mm -hmm. have? Should they be equal to white people? Mm -hmm. But then that's another question because what is a white person mm -hmm. and generally speaking in pre-Civil War America, well for that matter, 1930s America, mm -hmm. a white person had to be uh, of British stock. Mm -hmm. And so, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, so any of these other immigrant yeah. groups oh, didn't yeah. necessarily, no, no, necessarily it, count. Yeah, mm -hmm. World War II is what mm -hmm. actually whitens most yeah. people. Um, people like me, yeah. and, and so uh, there, there are all sorts of harsh mm -hmm. terms used uh, in the in the 19th century uh, dealing with the Irish and the Scots Irish mm -hmm. and uh, other people that, yeah. that uh, they are pasty faced, but mm -hmm. but uh, um, <laughs> they're, yeah, they're, it's, it's a very interesting point that Dr. Ben makes when he says that there there was discrimination within the abolitionist movement. You know, Benjamin Quarles wrote a book called Black Abolitionists, mm -hmm. uh, distinguishing the predominantly majority abolitionists from black abolitionists who wanted slavery to end immediately. There were some abolitionists who felt that we would gradually, we should have gradual abolition, you know, which had occurred, of course, in the, in the ninth, in 18th century with Pennsylvania in 1780, the Gradual Abolition Act. We, New York in, in 1799 with New Jersey in 1804. And what people don't know is that all the 13 original colonies, all of them, even those that didn't have plantations, had slavery from the very beginning, mm -hmm. you know. And this question, you make a very interesting point about the idea of whiteness. You know, we don't really see this term in the lexicon until 1790 over the whole idea of who was a citizen. Mm -hmm. And at that time it was defined that if you were white, you were a citizen. But then what did that mean? You know, as Dr. Mikko says, that when you have in the late, early 20th century, you have the uh, Jews coming, the Italians coming, were they considered, quote unquote, white? No, they were not, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. So it's very loose term itself, you know. Mm -hmm. Now, the mm -hmm. whole idea that he was not the great emancipator, yeah. is that something that people will have issue with? Is that oh, it, it uh, <laughs> violates the, all of the mythology around him. And, you know, that's part of what scholars do is mm -hmm. deal with the mythology and, and uh, rebuild, mm -hmm. rebuild the myth. Uh, for example, uh, historians feel that Lincoln is uh, the second best president ever you know, after mm -hmm. George Washington. And, but again, the reason for that is the Pennsylvania and James Buchanan, that, that he messed things up so badly that on March 4th, you know, he turns over the presidency to Lincoln and within a month and a half, we're involved in the Civil War. And, and uh, 
you know, these are uh, the, the kinds of issues that, that, that we talk about and, uh, you know, mm -hmm. political issues that, um, that violate the, these, these ideas that everybody knows. Yeah, individuals right. tend to think that you're bashing Lincoln, you know, that he is unfairly, you're unfairly criticizing Lincoln and that he did take some action unlike any other president. And it's unfortunate that individuals who are going to teach in the elementary and secondary level, that they go into the classroom already learning from traditional historians that Lincoln freed the slaves, you know. We don't talk about anyone freeing anyone, you know, that if you don't demand freedom yourself, you know, you don't make any actions, then obviously you're responsible for what you do. You know, so yes, people will be very upset at the criticisms. I was telling you earlier that I went to see the Lincoln film that came out uh, the first day and I couldn't get in. It was, it was jam-packed, you know. And at the end of the movie, you know, the people are clapping, you know, because Lincoln, they passed the 13th Amendment. Uh, and it shows Lincoln passionately against slavery. There's, there's one scene where he says, I want it in now, now, and now. But in fact, when you really read the record, there was no passionate about ending slavery when the Civil War began. So thus we have this illusion that the Civil War was over the question of slavery. Mm -hmm. That was part of the question. The question was, what type of society would we be in? one of free labor or one of slave labor itself. So it's very, uh, I think, simplistic, you know, to look at the Civil War simply as over the question of slavery because as one soldier stated when the war began, when African Americans wanted to be involved, they said this is a white man's war, mm -hmm. not a war with slavery. And then the Irish got upset when they were uh, forced to fight in a war over the question of slavery in 1863 when we had these riots in, in New York City. So that's what I'm saying. I'm saying mm -hmm. that, yes, he was an important person, Yes, we should know the actions that he took, but I think also we need to know what caused Lincoln to secretly first announce the emancipation in 1862, and then why Constance consistently for six months did he attempt to try to do something to abolish this whole ideal? So yeah, is, is, this, is, this mm -hmm. is a lot of it mythology? Is a lot of you know, what we know and think of Lincoln a, a myth that's not necessarily on the market. It fits market. into the whole American ideal of freedom. You know, we don't like to be think 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 that we are hypocritical about the idea that all men are created equal and endowed with able rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. You know? Well, but but also what you have is is politics. Once Lincoln is dead, he becomes a symbol for all sorts of folks who mm -hmm. want to use him. So, for example, uh, in the 19th century, uh, we in Pennsylvania have to vote Republican because Lincoln won the war. And, and uh, the Democratic Party is the party of rebellion. Uh, and so we need to, to vote for Lincoln because Lincoln won the war. And then uh, this issue continues uh, in all sorts of interesting mm -hmm. ways. I mean, in the uh, African American community, yep. uh, you know, we need to be loyal to the Republican exactly. Party because Lincoln won the war, and because he's the great emancipator. And, and so the, the, the symbolism, I, I mean, anybody who's no longer around uh, can be used in any, any sort of way because he's not going to object, yeah. right? And no it is interesting, Lincoln was a Republican, right? Yes, right. Uh -huh. And the party of does he tend more toward Democratic ideals as we think of today's Democrats and Republicans? or? Well, he is the he is the advocate of uh, giant, huge, strong central government. I mean, that's uh, one of the critiques from the Tea Partiers is that that Lincoln uh, Lincoln was a, a a big government man, and and that that's what makes him yeah. mm -hmm. somewhat questionable. But for the Tea Partiers, the pro the other problem is that uh, African Americans vote for the Democratic Party. Well then they come back with the, the Democratic Party is the party of the rebellion. Mm -hmm. And so, but it, so everything is, is spectacularly complex and mm -hmm. kind of um, moderately humorous when you, when you break it down rather. Yeah. And, and, and it's, it's tough. And so uh, the iconic Lincoln is, is an idea to, to sort of yeah. make him human again. And, and I think it's important too to look at the political realignment of the parties uh, in the 1930s with the rise of uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, you know, who then becomes sort of Lincoln-like with the utilization of the government to solve some of these social problems, you mm -hmm. know, and then where you see in 1936 African Americans who were voting Lincoln, voting Republican prior to that, now are voting Democrat to support 
FDR and, and, and his big government ideal. So if Lincoln was living today, he would probably be a Democrat utilizing this, the government to solve social problems, you know. Mm -hmm. And now African Americans vote primarily 85, 90 percent Democrat, simply because the Democratic Party seems to be the party of, of liberalism, or the party of, that is more sensitive to African American issues. So it's, and that's a liberal it, idea mm -hmm. for Lincoln to, you know, say, okay, the Emancipation Proclamation, freedom of slaves, mm -hmm. and so forth. That's that's liberal, right? I mean, that's really breaking from the. Well, I would call it more of a political ideal than a liberal ideal. I mean, Lincoln, you know, he, you know, what does he, what does, what does he say or do after Emancipation Proclamation uh, goes into effect? What was mm -hmm. Lincoln's position on the status and role of African Americans in the new society? After the emancipation what was his position? Well, we don't know. Mm -hmm. now, unfortunately, he was assassinated, you know, in April of 1865. It'll be interesting to see had he lived, you know. But I think he made some statements that can, can give us an, an a ideal of where he stood. You know, as one of these, he said that that like any person, I would like to have the superior position, mm -hmm. or that I'm not equating or advocating equality with African Americans. Well, those kind of ideals, I'm not sure if those are liberal ideals or not, that he's not sure whether or not he's talking about equality, you know. And the thing about Lincoln, I think, is very interesting, is that we can take any of his speeches to advocate or, or, to, or to prove that he, he believed in a certain thing. You know, he mm -hmm. often said that if he could end the Civil War by freeing all slaves, I would do that. That sounds great to me, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Or then he said, well, I, can, I would end the Civil War if I could free some slaves and free others. So... Looking at the Emancipation Proclamation, what did it actually do? What it did was that it freed only those enslaved persons living in the rebellious states. Mm -hmm. it did not free those enslaved persons that were living in Maryland, Missouri, Kentucky, Delaware. When did they gain their freedom? It was not, it was not as a result. Were, was it still legal to have slaves in Delaware, It was still legal to have Delaware, slaves Maryland? in Delaware. Missouri. Those were the, the border states that were very crucial to mm -hmm. the war itself. Had he done that, then obviously those border states probably would have went over to the Confederate side, which may have been a different outcome. Mm -hmm. So again, that's why I say he was an astute politician who understood the context of the towns he was living in and knew he could not free those 800,000. That's almost one-fourth mm -hmm. of the entire slave population that remained enslaved despite the great emancipator. I got a problem with that. When did those 800,000 gain their freedom? So is great emancipator, is it more of, you know, we're in love with the idea of Lincoln, not the reality of Absolutely, Lincoln? Absolutely, yeah. I, he's, he's used as a brand, essentially. I mean, uh, uh, at the centennial of his birth, they put him on the penny. You know, the, I, I mean, it's, it's uh, if you look at old uh, uh, school, uh, one-room schoolhouses, there's a picture of George Washington on one side the picture of Lincoln on the other mm -hmm. and ironically uh, uh, if you look at uh, pictures of the parades of the second Ku Klux Klan in the 1920s they're holding pictures of George Washington they have American flags and there's a picture of Abraham Lincoln really and, yeah. uh, but the the 1920s Klan was focused on Americanism that mm -hmm. America first 100% uh, Americanism yeah. that's the issue that's the big issue and again, the, this is rather complex as well because mm -hmm. in the South, the second clan is is like the first clan, but in the North, generally, well, again, it's complex. But, did, but did the clan uh, kind of grow out of the results of the Civil War? Or absolutely, was it? yeah. Uh, one of the things that happens is that another Pennsylvanian named mm -hmm. Thaddeus Stevens convinces Congress uh, to punish the traitors, mm -hmm. take away their right to vote, and, and give the right to vote to African Americans, to the ex-slaves. Well, the men, not, not the women. I mean, the mm. men we're not talking something crazy. <laughs> yeah. uh, uh, so uh, enfranchise the ex-slaves, disfranchise the, the, the traitors, and, and that basically pushed the Ku Klux Klan. But the leaders of the Klan were, were not nice people to begin with. I mean, the, and nasty uh, oh, Nathan Bedford Forrest, yeah. not not known for being a, a a good man in the Civil War. I mean, he uh, the let's see the Battle of Fort Pillow. Pillow, yeah. When African Americans were surrendering, and they were slaughtered, you know, a, a battle they never they never forgot. You know, 
They were surrendering. They were fighting for the north or the south? Standing right. For the north. For the, yeah. Yeah. And, and uh, uh, Nathan Bedford Forrest was the commander of the Confederate troops, and he didn't do anything to stop them from, uh, from killing the, the, the black soldiers that were surrendering. So, it, And then you, have the, then you have the reemergence of the Klan in 1915. I mean, the so-called new clan that Dr. Nick was talking about, you know, who were not simply uh, anti-black, but anti-black, anti-Jewish, anti-Catholic, uh -huh. you know, who uh, whose strong areas were not simply just in the South, but in Midwestern states like Indiana and Illinois. I mean, there were a number of, of clan groups that were very strong in this particular area itself, who were really emerging as a result of this new era. After America's now fighting in World War One. Uh, they marched on Washington, 25,000 strong, I believe, but unmasked, mm -hmm. you know. So they were responding to this new modern era itself, you know. And, of course, we had the third phase of the Klan, which was in the 1960s, the second Civil War, mm -hmm. you know. So my, th my thing is this, is that how can we say that, about the Great Emancipator, that 100 years later, mm -hmm. you know, you're still fighting for voting rights, civil rights, still fighting to be considered first-class citizens, you know, mm -hmm. And the whole ideal that uh, a good comparison would be how Lincoln was perceived in 1860 and how John F. Kennedy was perceived in 1960. Mm -hmm. I think they share a history. You know, in my family, there's a picture often of Lincoln on one side, John Kennedy on the other side, and Dr. King. And mm -hmm. so they all agree, had the same ideals. Mm -hmm. But John F. Kennedy, similar to Lincoln, he also was pushing the glory. You know, elected as a result of his uh, releasing, getting Kennedy, rele Kennedy King released from jail. African Americans voted primarily for Kennedy in that election. They mm -hmm. thought he was a civil rights president. But when you look at his, his life, no civil rights bill in 1961, no civil rights bill in 1962. And again, had he not been assassinated in 63, I'm not so sure we'd have been talking it's about John F. Kennedy. Really, LBJ yeah. that oh, yes. comes through yes, with it. Yes, exactly. Right? You know, yeah. Ironically, under LBJ, then you had the civil rights bill of 1964, the voting rights bill of 1965, and then what did those really mean? You know, was Johnson really for civil rights and voting rights, you know? I always think it's important to look at the context of what's going on in that particular era. Had it not been for the Birmingham March, the March on Washington, the killing of the three civil rights workers in Philadelphia, Mississippi, had it not been for those things, ordinary people <laughs> doing extraordinary things who really push and make history. We usually look at the big people, the big names, you know, the Lincolns, you know, the George Washingtons, you know, the John Kennedys. But it's really ordinary people who really make history, whose name will never be in the history books, but they force these individuals to do things that they obviously probably would not have done otherwise had it not been a movement in the eighteen sixties or a movement in the nineteen sixties. Now getting back to Lincoln as the great emancipator and everything though, is this to say that he didn't necessarily mean uh, or have the original intent to free the slaves and so forth that he was just forced by history? Yeah, most historians agree with that. Yeah. Really? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. You know, he was an he was a evolving president. That's not, look, that's, that's not see, see him as a static person. Mm -hmm. He was evolving from the circumstances that, is, that was around him. I give him credit for that, for evolving and understanding that things were changing. Mm -hmm. you know, he was not at the head of that change was not pushing for it, but history itself was moving him to do something that he probably would not have done. So let's give him credit for evolving and understanding that he wanted to be on the right, on the right side of history. Mm -hmm. Now the abolitionists, there were also some religious movements that were oh, going sure. on yeah. at the time too. Were, were most of those religious movements oh, for abolition? Were oh, they, was that sure. A uh, but this is kind of interesting because mm -hmm. we're at uh, Edinburgh University. Uh, started out as the normal school uh, because Pennsylvania uh, enacted the Free Schools Act of 18, 1834. And uh, so those Second Great Awakening reformers, they believed that slavery was a sin, that publicly funded education was necessary to help children make good decisions uh, in their lives. They believed that we should stop drinking because uh, we should put Jesus at the center of our lives instead of the bottle. Uh, they, uh, they came up with uh, prison reform, the idea of putting prisoners in single cells so they could think about and be penitent in a penitentiary. Mm -hmm. So Cherry Hill in uh, Philadelphia, mm -hmm. that's, that's uh, so virtually everything about our modern society and the way we think about 
uh, solutions to problems mm -hmm. come out of that second great awakening of the mm -hmm. yeah, 1820s, 30s, and 40s. So, mm -hmm. you know, it, it, it's neat that we're at Edinburgh University that, that's sort of a, a result of that whole right. thing. And so, yeah, the, the, that, uh, that religious movement, extremely important, and, and you have inter interactions between uh, people who believed in one reform and the other. One other reform that comes out of the Second Great Awakening, uh, most of the foot soldiers of, of reform were women, mm -hmm. and the, uh, the people that ran the organizations were men, and uh, some of the men were not competent. And so the women started asking some, themselves, why aren't we mm -hmm. considered competent? And, and so then what you have is this movement to uh, increase the competence, the legal <laughs> competence of women, mm -hmm. to allow women to do all sorts of stuff that you know, enter the professions, uh, vote, uh, own property, transfer mm -hmm. property, you name it. Is that mm -hmm. suffrage in general, or is suffrage like just yeah. one component? Yeah, of suffrage that whole? was one component of it. But um, the, again, that's an interesting political issue because uh, in 1848, mm -hmm. the the women at Seneca Falls, mm -hmm. uh, well, actually, not just women, mm -hmm. everybody that shows up at Seneca Falls, including abolitionists, mm -hmm. talked about uh, equal rights for women. We yeah. need a constitutional amendment, yeah. darn it. Uh -huh. And and uh, but by the end of the 19th century, essentially, that um, narrows down to uh, just suffrage mm -hmm. as, as the big demand. So we had the uh, 19th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution in 1920. Mm -hmm. But Pennsylvania has an equal rights clause in the in the state constitution, but we still don't have one in the, in the United States Constitution. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. So interesting. Yeah. <laughs> So abolition, was it, was it big, uh, not nearly as big before it joined forces with all the different religious movements and women's movements? And yeah, it had yeah, a, large, a large part to play with. I think it was 1844, maybe 36, when Congress passed a law, the gag rule, where you couldn't right. send petitions to Congress. It became illegal to do that because they were receiving so many letters you know, about abolishing slavery, et cetera. Congress passed a law saying you couldn't even send any petitions to Congress anymore. But so, uh, mm -hmm. on the state level, mm -hmm. uh, on the other hand, you have the laws that uh, 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 are used to uh, forbid kidnapping. Uh, the, the movie 12 Years a Slave mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is, is all about the idea that uh, entrepreneurial kidnappers from mm -hmm. the South would come into New York City or Philadelphia or Pittsburgh, Cincinnati, any uh, border city, kidnap an African American, mm -hmm. uh, take away his mm -hmm. uh, his papers, take him south, sell him as a slave. I, I mean, this is a, a, a spectacular uh, problem. That that I mean, the, that movie Twelve Years a Slave mm -hmm. that that uh, is um, um, uh, spectacularly moving and, and angers people, but but. Yeah, I, again, this is stuff that's... The and probably yeah, still a yeah. problem after the Civil War, right? And after the emancipation. Mm -hmm. Is that still... Like, do we slowly transition after the war? In uh, terms of attitudes? Uh, or getting rid system? of slavery. Like, is it still oh. well, 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 the question practiced? is, you know, is, is slavery, by another, slavery by another name. Uh, I think it's a very important uh, concept. You know, Jim Crow, uh, segregation, uh, Penis laws that if you don't, if you're not working, you can be arrested and and, and be sold to someone to to work your your fine off. I mean, slavery didn't just end all of a sudden in 1863 or 1865 after the Emancipation Proclamation or after the 13th Amendment. You know, there was ways to circumvent that. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, up until 1954, it was legal, legal segregation was legal by the mm -hmm. by the U.S. Con U.S. Supreme Court in 1896, Plessy versus Ferguson. Mm -hmm. You know, so things and then just just change, and they didn't change even after 1954, after the Brown decision. And we're still dealing with some of the repercussions, you know, of America's original sin. Mm -hmm. you know, that original sin, of course, being slavery. You know, mm -hmm. but to give you a case in point of what Dr. Minko was saying is that there was a case of a Margaret Garner, from Pennsylvania, a woman who had escaped slavery with her kids. Uh, the slave catchers were coming to, to, to rescue, to, not rescue, but to take her back to slavery. She decided that instead of having her kids go, to, go back to slavery, she killed them. Hmm. You know, I mean, what does that mean? It's pretty radical. Know? What approach, does that mean? Yeah. 
that means that they were radical about the idea of being of being free, mm -hmm. you know. And today, you know, Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania is a very rural state, mm -hmm. you know. And that we think about the Klan and neo-Nazi groups, you know, in the time of Mississippi and Georgia, et cetera. But this state that we live in is one of the most populated states. Oh, at one right point wing, they were you know, talking about is, settling out in yeah, I don't exactly, know, Potter County you know, or whatever. So it was not just a southern problem, which we see. You know, mm -hmm. it was also a northern problem as well. It was no legal slavery, but the question is, should you stay in your place, and whatever mm -hmm. your place meant? That's also been a problem, particularly in the North itself. Mm -hmm. You know. Now you talked about mm -hmm. uh, the Second Civil War, mm -hmm. like 1960s yeah. and so forth. Is that because of civil rights and? Because, I'm because thinking, of civil rights, you, and, and, and you also it, have women's rights going there, oh, so sure. it's almost yeah. like these. You have the issues. resistance against Brown decision, and the, the resistance of, of the resistance of the South, particularly, against the ideal that we should be, have to go to the same school, we should have to share the same uh, facilities with African Americans. That was another struggle mm -hmm. that went on in the, in the South and in the North, which we often, never talk about. So that was the Second Civil War, the, the fight and battle you know, against uh, uh, Southern um, uh, consequences of the war itself. And also, of course, to the response of the federal government, you know, mm -hmm. forced by circumstances to do things that they would not have done. Central Rock case, you know, nine black children admitted into a central high school that the governor calls out the National Guard not to admit the nine kids. And Dwight Eisenhower, who was not a liberal president, was forced by circumstances to call out the 82nd Airborne in order to admit nine children into this high school. So that's why we refer to this whole period, you know, as the second Civil War, the second period of Reconstruction, you know, that really is very sim symbolic, mm -hmm. you know. The question is, what had been solved 100 years earlier? You know, Dr. King's speech in March on Washington, he begins by saying four score years, five score years ago, a great American shed a beacon of light of hope on the Negro slaves, but the Negro are still not free. This is 1963. Mm -hmm. To say the Negro is still not free, what does he mean by that? And he, what he's talking about is the circumstances and conditions had not really changed tremendously enough you know, for African Americans. It's he not to say there hadn't been no progress. And let me make this clear. It's not to say there had not been no progress. Obviously, it was much better than being in chains. Obviously. Mm -hmm. you know, but in terms of the ability to, to enjoy life, mm -hmm. you know, and to reach the highest heights that your ability does, that had not existed yet. Uh, he, he talked about the metaphor of the check, that the check had been written, but uh, it bounced. Mm -hmm. So it, essentially, that's, that's what mm -hmm. uh, Dr. King was talking about. Right. So the check had been written by Lincoln and the Civil War and so well, forth. Somebody wrote the check. <laughs> somebody <laughs> yeah. wrote the check, but it was, it was no good here. Yeah. Right. Whatever. Well, talking about, okay, first I want to go back a little bit mm -hmm. and then maybe come forward a little bit. Going back, what, what are the historic origins of slavery? How did that even evolve? What, where'd that come from? Okay. It's interesting that um, when the 13 colonies uh, were found into the, the nation itself, that, let me, let me go back a little further. Jamestown, Virginia. A lot of people like to say that the 20 odd Negroes that came here in 1619 were slaves. They were not. They okay. were indigent servants. Okay. So we don't have slavery in these colonies up until 1661 in Virginia, and then 1663 in Maryland. And what had happened was that it was very difficult, you know, to kind of maintain the indentured servants, which most of us came as. And we also saw the, 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 the um, growth of the sugar colonies in Barbados and the Caribbean. Mm -hmm. The question was, well, you know, these guys are doing very well over there in, in the Caribbean. So it's an economic issue uh, in in America, the the, the rise of slavery. Basically, uh, what uh, what sort of labor do we want, and how how much are we willing to pay for it? The the problem with indentured servants was that there was a there was a term of indenture, mm -hmm. five, seven, eight years, and and then they're free to go. Yeah, right. So you can't have and, that. And, right. And, if you're going to have a profitable. And, an interesting thing is that then you have an African-American who is an indentured servant who is also himself, frees himself, and then buys indentured servants himself. He's buying white and black indentured servants in Maryland. Okay, but the other crop, the other thing that it has to be seen is the rise of tobacco 
as a uh, cash crop mm -hmm. in, in Virginia and in Maryland. You know, the need for intensive labor also demands that there has to be a labor force. And it's much easier, you know, to uh, select a person who you can identify simply by color uh -huh. as being an enslaved person. You know, that's very important. And then, of course, later on in the 18th century, you have, of course, the emergence of cotton as a right. major cash crop. Oh, right. uh, no, slavery no. is almost dying out by 1790. It's almost dying out. Then we have the invention of the cotton gin. Was it really almost oh, dying yes. out? Yes. Yeah. Yes, it was almost dying out. But then we had the cotton gin, Eli Whitney. It became much easier. You know, let's start and, and let's, making these textiles. Start, yes, yeah. yes, and cotton became the leading American export product in the, in, uh, in the United States. The leading from 1793 to 1860, it is the leading crop. New need for labor force. You know? So uh, what is the wealth of the South, people like to say? Was it tobacco? No. Was it rice? No. Was it cotton? No. The wealth of the South was the uh, $8 billion invested and that four million enslaved persons. That mm -hmm. was the wealth of the South. And why the Civil War took place was because you were changing a whole way of life. You know, I'm a Southerner. You mean tell me you're gonna take my slaves away and I've been living so good like this now? What are you gonna mess my economy? Mm -hmm. That was the question. And you were messing yeah, with their exactly, economy, right? That exactly. Was a, you know. Mm -hmm. But at the root of the Civil War. Is is at the economy the at the War, oh, yes. at the root of it all? Oh yes. Well, you have to see slavery as an economic institution and not simply as a social institution. Uh -huh. Without these crops, without these tobaccos and rice and, and cotton and all of that, without all of that, there would be no need for slavery. So it's almost purely economic, or is it? Oh, there, there's no other explanation for it. Uh, I mean, there's no need. For example, in, in Pennsylvania, mm -hmm. uh, you don't have those crops. I mean, except in the extreme southern tier, do you have tobacco? Mm -hmm. But you don't have crops that that require the the uh, the labor. The the problem with the tobacco plant is that the plant, it, the leaf itself, that's your money. Mm -hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. so you got uh, bugs that eat the leaf. They're eating money, and so you need to send people out in the fields on a regular basis pick the bugs off the plant. You need to send people out to, to uh, um, chop out the weeds mm -hmm. so that the p tobacco plant grows more and has more leaves. Mm -hmm. And again, you need the, the, the consistent labor force. So tobacco, cotton, sugarcane, and so forth yeah. are, are just so different than, say, when we get the uh, cotton up north and start making the fabric mm -hmm. and so forth. That's a yeah. Right. But notice, notice that connection between the south and New England states, Massachusetts, that cotton that is picked on slave labor being shipped up to New England to mm -hmm. these uh, textile mills to create products. Right. Well, notice, the, notice the shipbuilders. Now they've got the women and children the put to work, right? Up in, up in New England states, slave ship buildings. You know, there's a connection between the South and the North in terms of slavery. Uh -huh. You know, and that connection is something that we rarely look at. I mean, how did you get sh cotton up to New England states. That's the, the abolitionists. Yeah. Again, mm -hmm. uh, one of the things that they talk about on a regular basis is boycotts of slave goods. Mm -hmm. So we don't wear cotton, we wear linen or we wear woolens. Mm -hmm. And uh, so the Quakers in a place like Philadelphia mm -hmm. would be wearing woolens or, or linens rather than cotton because cotton is a slave good. Oh. They would put honey in their, in their uh, tea or coffee mm -hmm. because sugar is a slave good. And, you know, it just goes on and on and on like that. So it's, it's rather interesting. So they had I mean, those kind of protests early yeah, yeah, on. Yeah. Right, right. And, and so, again, you know, modern, lots of stuff that we can uh, think of as modern is actually uh, mm -hmm. stuff that goes back to that, those second great awakening reformers that were going to fix us and take, right. uh, make us better people. Yeah. So that's talking about, you know, where, where slavery came from. But where are we now? Are we, are we where we should be? Or are we? Are, yeah, are there great still the vestiges? I mean, that's been great progress. I mean, the one that cannot deny it's been great progress. I mean, you know, you have of course the, the highest office in the land is an African American. You know, which you wouldn't be unheard of, almost 40 years ago, unheard of. You know, 
even people who, who he denied as, as possible that African American become president. So I was has been a great progress. You have, a, you have people who are in fields and the head of, uh, I think, Microsoft now is an African American. So there's been great progress. But what has happened is that there's been progress among a certain select few of the African American community. That still, as, as, as Michael Harrington wrote in 1963, he said, there's the invisible poor, he calls them all. 40 million Americans remain invisible despite the whole 1950s uh, period of uh, great prosperity. Likewise, in the 21st century now, there's a great divide among the have and have nots, not only in terms of American society, but also within the African American community. You know, so although we've progressed, you know, there's much more work needs to be done. And now we see the regression of that, you know, the ideal that uh, we need to have new laws for voting rights and to have an ID, you need to be able to, et cetera. I think we're going backwards in that sense, you know, because of this mm -hmm. whole notion that somehow we are a new country. As one guy says, he says, we need to get our country back. Mm -hmm. What does that mean? You need to get your country back. Mm -hmm. So back where? Back to the 80s? Back to the 60s? Back to the... 18th century? I mean, what do you mean, get our country back? There was a meeting held on the night of the first inauguration at the uh, hotel in Washington, D.C., among some of the conservatives who said that this is going to be a one-term president. Mm -hmm. We're going to make sure he's a one-term president. When you have things like that, you know, or pictures that are showing uh, President Obama as a, as a Hitler, you know, and socialism and, and all of that. Well, there you go. There's very, that very, myth, very myth very again. Oh, yes. And iconic types of images yeah. and just trying to blend and metaphorically create something. <laughs> well, uh, the same thing is done with uh, Ronald Reagan. Mm -hmm. He's gone and, and now we can use him for, for anything. I mean, uh, President Obama <laughs> yeah. invokes Ronald Reagan and, and so I does uh, so do Republicans. And yeah. so, uh, yeah, what, once the, the person passes from the scene, he, uh, she becomes a commodity. Uh, um, I, I read, um, let's see, we're on the anniversary of the, the, uh, the death of uh, the author of Silent Spring. Um, she, she became a symbol of, of you know, radical environmentalism, but then again, all she did in her book was to say that, that bug sprays mm -hmm. have long-term <laughs> effects, and, and uh, um, does that make her a... Uh, an environmental radical. Right. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. So this is all um, going to come together mm -hmm. in a couple weeks here. We're going to have presentations around the Civil War mm -hmm. and the presentation that you two will be participating in will be the iconic Lincoln mm -hmm. and people can come to yeah. see that. And the move in the film, The Abolitionist Movement, The Abolitionist, which is a film that was done by the National Endowment for Humanities, and the Guild of Lerma, uh, Lerma history uh, uh, being, I think, is very important. So when That's you on see, Tuesday. Yeah, when you see that film, then you'll see things that I'm talking about in terms of the abolitionists and Lincoln. And you will hear, you know, Lincoln talking about, you know, trying to get around this Emancipation Proclamation. So I think it's very important for people to see the film, you know, to give some backdrop to what we'll be talking about on that Wednesday. Great, wonderful. It'd be a nice one, two, three, and then yeah. see the art yeah, exactly. and the photos and everything exactly. on Thursday after that. Right. So that's uh, April 22nd, 23rd, and 24th yes. coming up, yes. sponsored by the History Department. Yes. May Ehor, thanks for being with us. Thank you. The uh, next chair of the Department of History, Anthropology, and World Languages. How about that? Uh, Congratulations. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. Thanks. All right. Sounds good. Yeah, it was. Okay. That was good.